good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you uh, to this session on living better, living longer, and living stronger uh, among women living with HIV. My name is Karen Yerenda, and I'm your co-chair today. My sister co-chair here is Alice uh, Welburn. And many thanks to Professor Sophia Gruskin for compiling this session. So to start with, I'd like to introduce my co-chair. Alice Welburn is a writer, researcher, trainer, and gender activist, and was diagnosed with HIV 22 years ago. She is the author of the Stepping Stones training manual on gender HIV communication and relationship skills, which reduces gender violence, and she is still she is still being newly, uh, it is still uh, being newly adapted for use in diverse communities around the world. Alice is a former chair of ICW, which is the International Community of Women Living with HIV and AIDS, and is founding director of the Salamander Trust and holds a PhD from Cambridge University in Social Anthropology. Alice. Thank you very much, Carol, and I'd like to join Carol in welcoming you welcoming you all here this morning. Apparently we have Bill Clinton next door, so we especially appreciate you all being here with us this morning for these great papers we're going to hear. So I'd like to introduce Carol to you. Carol Nawina Nyerenda is a public health advocate, an international speaker and a trainer from Lusaka in Zambia. Carol is the executive director of the Community Initiative for Tuberculosis, HIV and AIDS and Malaria, and she's based in Lusaka. She's also the national coordinator of the Coalition of Zambian living, Women Living with HIV. At an international level, Carol's been a board member representing people living with HIV and those affected by TB on the Global Fund Board, UNITAID, Stop B TB Partnership, and is still on the International Union Against TB and Lung Diseases. So you can see that's just to mention a few of Carol's many great roles. At regional level, Carol is the president of the Africa Coalition on Tuberculosis and has recently been elected chairperson of the Pan-African Positive Women's Coalition. So, both living with HIV and having survived tuberculosis, Carol has been able to transform this personal experience into a political campaign to address TB and HIV co-infection and has incorporated TB advocacy into her national and global activism. And last but by no means least, Carol is currently undertaking a bachelor's degree in development studies. So, that's... Carol and me for you. And now we are going to hand back to you. Thank you. Uh, so like Ali said, we have, I think, Bill Clinton's session coming on uh, very quickly after this one. Uh, for your questions, we have only 15 minutes at the end of the session for all our questions. So please uh, think about your questions that you would like to ask during the, the presentation. Write them down clearly on pieces of paper and hand them to the volunteers. I think there are volunteers around who will be going around with pieces of paper. The volunteer at the front, they'll come to the front here so we can have them quickly and hand them at the end. Please do your best to keep your questions really short and clear. And please add your name and organization and country to your question. So uh, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Our first uh, speaker is Dr. Andre Alexandria uh, Martin One, I hope I pronounced it okay. Uh, after finishing internal medicine, Dr. Martin One worked at Medicines Saint Francier in Chad and Kenya in 2010. She was in Chad during a meningococcal epidemic, working in treatment and a vaccine campaign. In Kenya, she was a TB HIV manager, working with the district hospital of Homer Bay mainly focusing in the HIV clinic and working with multi-drug resistant TB uh, patients. Uh, after MSF, she studied infectious disease and she currently works at the infectious disease department in the Oncological Reference Center at a national institute in Mexico. Uh, your, 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 the floor is yours. 
Thank you. So, good morning. Uh, I would like to thank the organizing committee for letting us present our data today. Uh, these are the result of a descriptive study of Mexican women recently diagnosed with HIV, and this study was conducted in two of the most important HIV care centers in Mexico City and uh, in two other states, Oaxaca and Puebla, which are, uh, uh, play an important role in HIV burden in Mexico. So just uh, a, a few facts uh, for the background. HIV prevalence in Mexico is around 0.3%, and it is a concentrated epidemic driven by infection in men who have sex with men. And late presentation remains the most important challenge. Women represent 20% of affected population, and in Mexico, detection campaigns focus on high-risk groups such as sex workers, men who have sex with men, uh, injection drug users that do not include women. The only official screening strategy for HIV detection in women is pregnancy. And as we all know, HIV-infected women are a particularly vulnerable group, and they represent a double challenge since uh, detection in this group is also impacts in preventing mother-to-child transmission. So with this study, we tried to answer to uh, three main questions. What are the socio-demographic and clinical characteristics of women, Mexican women recently diagnosed with HIV infection? And we chose recently diagnosed, so we could really say that the facts, factors that we could, could find were really uh, current factors in, in the HIV epidemic. How are women diagnosed with HIV? And are there specific factors reflecting increased vulnerability in women infected with HIV, such as economic situation, low-level education, and power and gender inequities? So we included Mexican-born HIV-infected women that were diagnosed between 2009 and 2013, attending one of the four HIV care centers that I already mentioned. So Oaxaca and Puebla are two HIV care centers that include a less urbanized population with a higher proportion of low socioeconomic level and a higher proportion of indigenous population. In Mexico City, Instituto de Nutrición is a tertiary care reference center, and Clinica Condesa is an ambulatory clinic that is mostly represented by MSM. Uh, women were invited to participate when they came to consultation. We did visits to the centers to invite them, and they had to sign an informed consent. Data were obtained through structured face-to-face -face interviews and medical records, including sociodemographic data, uh, sociocultural, social context, and also clinical data obtained from the medical files. Standard statistic analysis was done with STATA, and ethics approval was obtained. And all women were offered legal and psychological counseling at the end of the interviews if needed. So here are the results. We invited 331 women uh, of those, 270 were interviewed and 61 did not accept the interview. Mostly due to time limitations, the interview lasted around 30 to 45 minutes and they had to go to work or to pick up their, their child. Of these 61 women, 31 accepted for their file to be reviews, re reviewed and we had a sample of 301 women included. So we will show data from the files of the 301 women and we will show data from the interviews of the 270 women. And here are the proportions of the centers of the four different centers. So in global, 14% of the women uh, spoke or understood indigenous language. As you can see, a third of the population had like a, a primary school as the maximum degree of studies, and only a third had more than secondary, secondary school as the maximum degree of studies. Women were the only provider for their family in 20% of cases, and they participated in household income in 50%. And for 94% of the sample, the monthly income in US dollar was lower than $500. 
For the medical context, 21% had any comorbidity, including diabetes, arterial hypertension, dyslipidemia. There was 11% uh, of history of alcohol abuse and illicit substance abuse. Uh, age at first pregnancy was around 20 years old, and as you can see, almost a third of the women had less than 18 years old at the first pregnancy. And 34% uh, uh, had another sexually transmitted disease at the moment of, of HIV diagnosis, mostly HPV infection in 72% of cases. 47% of women reported physical violence at home, and the, the, mo the most common aggressor was the previous or current partner in 70% of cases, and 30% reported sexual abuse, again, mostly by the, the current partner or previous partner as the main aggressor. There was a low history of spending time in jail, living in the U.S. or the borders as potential risk factors for HIV acquisition, and 10% reported history of paid sex. So there were differences between the centers. As I said, the profiles were a little bit different, and here we can, uh, we can see how Oaxaca and Puebla had a younger population, uh, lower than 30 years old. There were a higher proportion of uh, in, uh, women speaking an indigenous language in Oaxaca. There was a higher proportion of uh, illicit substance abuse and sexual abuse in Clinica Condesa, which is the ambulatory clinic, higher CD4, baseline CD4 in Oaxaca, and also higher diagnosis through pregnancy in Oaxaca. And we will talk about this later, but probably the reason why, why uh, there was higher CD4 in Oaxaca was associated with a younger population and more, more diagnosis through pregnancy. So we asked women how they thought they had acquired HIV. And 75% answered that they had acquired HIV through their stable partner. 24% had ever done an HIV test, and 23% suspected they could be infected before doing the test. Of these uh, 23%, less than half uh, ever did the test before because of, of suspecting. As for the reasons to get tested, 65% were tested because a healthcare provider recommended it. And here we can see the circumstances of HIV diagnosis. As you can see, these two bars represent 73% of the population. So 73% of women are diagnosed because one infected relative was diagnosed, either the partner or the child, or because they were already symptomatic. And only 10.6% were diagnosed through pregnancy, or 16% to other reasons such as donation, marriage, uh, job application, uh, non-medical recommendations. Age at diagnosis was 32, CD4 count at presentation was 203, and almost half of the sample had less than 200 CD4 at the moment of diagnosis. And we asked women if they had sought medical care for symptoms that should be related to HIV, and we defined these symptoms such as weight loss, fever, chronic diarrhea, oral candidiasis, and herpes. 40% of women referred they had sought medical care for these symptoms without being offered an HIV test. And as you can see, of the women who sought medical care, most of them did it more than three times. Moreover, almost 70% of the women who were diagnosed through symptoms, as you remember, that was 35% of all the sample, 70% of those women had sought medical care before because of symptoms. In this graph, we can see CD4 count according to the way the woman was diagnosed. And as you can see, women diagnosed through pregnancy had higher CD4 compared to other circumstances, 322 compared to 108 when they were symptomatic or 132 when they were diagnosed because of a child diagnosed. And I have to mention that there were 12 women diagnosed through a child positive, which should be a number that should be in zero. In this graph, we can see CD4 count, baseline CD4 count, according to the number of medical contacts prior to diagnosis without an HIV test offered because of symptoms. And we can see clearly how 
women who sought medical care or who attended more than five times to, uh, to medical uh, consultation had clearly less CD4 count at diagnosis compared to other situations. 31 CD4 at baseline compared to 256 when they didn't come to medical attention. This reflects missed opportunities of diagnosis. In this table, I show the different characteristics associated to late-stage diagnosis, which we defined as CD4 count at diagnosis less than 200. As you can see in the multivariate analysis, being older than 30 years was associated to having less CD4 at the moment of diagnosis with an OR of 1.89, and attending more than three consultations prior to diagnosis without an HIV test offered was also associated with uh, being uh, diagnosed with less than 200 CD4 with an OR of 3.56. As for prenatal care, we asked women if they had uh, been offered an HIV test during prenatal care, and as you can see, 61% of the women said they had never been offered an HIV test in any one of this, their pregnancies, and all these women did attend prenatal care. So for conclusions, Women recently diagnosed with HIV in Mexico have vulnerability factors such as a high prevalence of physical and sexual violence, low level of education, pregnancies at young age, low incomes, and acquiring HIV mainly through their stable partner. Women are detected late, except for women diagnosed during pregnancy. Most women, 73%, are diagnosed because of an infected partner or child or being symptomatic. And missed opportunities of early di earlier diagnosis and low rate of HIV testing were detected during medical and prenatal care. So late diagnosis in women seems to be the result of a deficient healthcare system and a lack of risk perception, both from healthcare workers and women, all in a context of high vulnerability and the absence of screening policies for non-pregnant women. And strategies for early detection need to be re-evaluated for women in countries with concentrated epidemics, such as the one in Mexico. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra. That was a very powerful presentation, and I think there are very, a lot of lessons there for um, a lot of different countries as well, not just Mexico. So that was, that was really, really valuable data there. Thank you.